So our speaker today is Albert Lazzarini. Uh, Albert is the head of data and computing for LIGO, which really means he's in charge of all the data analysis for LIGO, and he's the boss of anybody who thinks about data analysis. So I think about data analysis part of the time, I guess he's my boss part of the time. Albert. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Kip had asked me to put together uh, a lecture for your class on what we're doing at LIGO for planning for the LIGO 1 science run and possibly talk about LIGO 2. The emphasis I'm going to uh, place today will be on... The emphasis I've placed today will be on, on the LIGO 1 activities that we're pursuing. And I was going to organize this lecture to briefly remind those of you uh, who may not be aware of it of exactly what LIGO data attributes might be. I was going to provide a, a summary of noise processes, how we deal with random data, uh, their time and frequency domain properties. Then I was going to uh, show how all the gravitational wave signals that we might think about can be fit together in a time frequency classification from chirps to bursts and how that suggests a strategy for going after different types of sources. Then uh, I was going to mention search techniques for specific classes. The time will not permit to go through exhaustive discussion of all the sources, so I picked the Inspiral and Chirp as a classic uh, paradigm for how we want to do optimal Wiener filtering. And I also then will discuss briefly how we do a much more unmodeled uh, time frequency domain searches where we basically look for um, glitches that are unexpected in the historical trend of the data. As appropriate, I'll mention uh, computational costs and implementation, how we're going to go about uh, taking the ideal situation that's uh, been described in numerous papers and how we implement that in software to try to do this on a continuous basis with our large data volumes that we have. And then I'll touch briefly on the strategy that we uh, are planning take, to take advantage of the fact that LIGO is in fact building three detectors, not one, or three interferometers that constitute one detector that will be used in a coherent manner, and that there are other detectors around the world that are coming online about the same time, and we're already starting to formulate agreements with other uh, international programs to look at f formulating how one might put together an international network or phased array of gravitational wave detectors. As a reminder, um, you've had uh, several dis lectures discussing interferometry and their application to the problem at hand. Um, that we have a, a, a limiting noise curve that is dominated by three different. I have. A, we have a stick. Fine. Thank you. Thank you, Kip. At the lowest frequencies, we're limited by the fact that we're living in a terrestrial environment and the Earth is a moving body. In the mid range, we will be dominated by the fact that we're operating at 300 degrees Kelvin, so we have a thermal noise component where the materials of which our systems are made, the mirrors, the fibers, are always in uh, thermal motion and produce at least, for our case, an irreducible thermal noise source that will limit the mid-range of frequencies. And then at the highest frequencies, we're limited by the fact that we sample for progressively smaller and smaller periods of time to make statements about sensitivities at higher frequencies, and so we're limited by how many photons we can collect in shot noise. The sensitive region, as you know, then, is this U-shaped area that uh, kisses something like 10 to the minus 23 in spectral density per root hertz, as, as uh, we use to quote the sensitivity of our instrument. And I should mention that this curve is representative of what was uh, written in the 1989 proposal all of 13 years ago now. and Subsequent insights in, in the properties of thermal noise have uh, rendered the details here ch uh, slightly changed, but we still use this as our target sensitivity curve for uh, LIGO-1 uh, system. And the other point is that lurking below the sensitivity, indicative of a system that's been optimized for a particular targeted sensitivity floor, is that there are other components of thermal of, of noise that will uh, come, come into play 
as we produce progressively better instruments. And so we have to manage the thermal noise, no, the, the total noise budget in a systems level uh, sense to, to produce advanced interferometers that uh, expand the sensitivity region in all directions. I picked out two representative uh, uh, graphics from the literature that then attempt to place on the sensitivity curves for various generations of instruments. And the focus for uh, my discussion today is the blue curve here, which is LIGO 1, and the top dark curve labeled initial LIGO here. And this shows if you ascribe the change in the period of um, the, the millisecond pulsars that have been measured to the emission of gravitational waves, then in some sense you can put an upper limit to the strain sensitive to the strain signature you would expect if you could account for the slowdown of these pulsars due to emission of uh, gravitational waves and quadrupolar uh, formalism. And over here, I took a, uh, a set of composites that Kip had produced for an initial advanced LIGO conceptual design that we put together two years ago in which he had done a really good job of uh, compiling on here all the different types of sources from the stochastic background to the trajectory of the, uh, of the chirps as they come through the band to uh, potential sources of gravitational waves from pulsars which are also replicated here. The bottom line is that we will be expected to be operating at the very limits of sensitivity for our instruments. Um, we, until we get to the more advanced interferometers, we will be working right in the mud, so to speak, in terms of what the signal that we obtain from the instruments is and what we try to uh, extract from them to make statements about astrophysics. Consequently, part of the design of the instrument is to recognize that we have built a very sensitive transducer, this interferometer, which unfortunately is not sensitive only to gravitational waves. It has a response to Earth motion, to uh, laser light amplitude and frequency fluctuations of the light source, thermal noise, as I mentioned, and because we have small uh, miniature magnets that are used to control the attitude of the mirrors and their axial position to keep the system in lock, we potentially have some concern about being sensitive to electro electromagnetic interference uh, in the ambient environment. The consequence of that is that we have provided for a design that acquires many channels beyond just the gravitational wave channel. We look at signals that are uh, reflected not only of the differential motion, which we map into the gravitational wave strain, but also the common mode motion, which carries information about laser frequency fluctuations and, and alignment errors. We have uh, an outfitted, an array of microphones to look for ambient noise effects that could couple acoustically through pressure waves back into the transducer, into the uh, interferometer. And we have uh, seismometers that look for ground motion to be able to determine whether there's excess motion in the interferometer, uh, motion in the interferometer that could be explained by excess ground motion during a particular epoch of data taking. In order to keep track of all these uh, multitude of signals that we collect, we formulated jointly with the European uh, Virgo program uh, a, a frame format standard for how we will acquire data. And we've worked very hard over the past uh, four or five years to make sure that what we write here at, on the, in the United States can be transparently analyzed by the Europeans and vice versa, and that's a significant fraction of our software development efforts, is to uh, guarantee that we have interoperability of the software. We want to eventually exchange data, as I mentioned, but more importantly, um, at some point that provides us with a measure of independent software development uh, activities that look for the same signals in, in the data. One interesting uh, fact is that we acquire the strain channel at uh, 16 kilobytes per second, two byte digitized integers, so we have something like 30 kilobytes per second as the data stream that we acquire from each of the three interferometers. Uh, we all, ma uh, dwarfing the 32 kilobyte per second data rate is a two megabyte per second data rate that corresponds to the rest of the servo systems that are collected in the interferometer, which are basically health and uh, health status and housekeeping signatures, signals that will be used to verify that what we see here is, is credible for the epoch in which a putative event is detected. The environmental sensors that I mentioned earlier, the magnetometers and seismometers, uh, correspond to yet another megabyte per second of environmental data that we acquire. So when you put it all together, 
the, the science channel, the, 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 where all the physics, astrophysics will be contained is, is approximately only 1% of the data that we acquire. And we use GPS time stamps to provide uh, up to levels of about 100 nanoseconds uh, exact timing in the data that we acquire at both of our LIGO sites. So, in summary, we collect 1% is the gravitational wave channel, and I think I've already mentioned most of these things, so I can um, pass this slide. We are worried about, for example, whether you have line spikes. Everything is, uh, is nurtured by the 60 hertz uh, power grid in the northwest or in the Louisiana, so we are always monitoring the 60 hertz signal to see if there's uh, potential for transient pickup into our interferometers. Uh, the accelerometers provide for high frequency shock and vibration measurements at frequencies above about 100 hertz. Magnetic fields are of concern, so we have magnetometers that look for time dependent uh, fields such as those that might uh, occur in a building if you turn motors on and off. You've got the wiring network of the building which then in the presence of this transient produces a time dependent burst of sign signal that could in principle couple to the uh, interferometer. Seismometers provide for low frequency ground motion, and I've already mentioned acoustics. One concern we have is that we have four kilometer tubes that are highly evacuated, but if, any, if at any point uh, gas outgassing bursts occur within the tube walls, they could in principle produce a phase fluctuation that looks like a burst in the interferometer, and so one actually um, monitors at some low, low sample rate, but with the ability to trigger when events occur, uh, changes in substantial changes in vacuum pressure. And the Oregon group, uh, in our collaboration coming from high energy physics, has actually instrumented a muon shower detector, which we're looking for site wide cosmic ray showers that could illuminate the LIGO interferometers. It's been shown that uh, such high energy showers uh, are detectable in cryogenic bars, and so we want to also ask the question whether there was any uh, external cosmic ray activity at, at the time of any transient phenomenon that may be observed. How will we use these channels? Well, one thing we want to do with the, those channels that have the highest signal to noise is to uh, potentially cross-correlate and remove the contribution they make to the strain channel by a linear regression analysis, a standard least squares fit comparing uh, a matrix response of many channels to one channel. The other purpose of the multiple channels is to look, f is to validate that if we see something in the H of T channel that the instrument was behaving uh, nominally. So we want to continuously monitor interferometer environment and make sure that all these signals are within nominal, let's say, plus minus three sigma uh, performance. The other thing we can do is empirically, we can determine what a typical channel's uh, power spectrum looks like so that we can actually compare the data at this epoch with historical trends to, to identify whether we have any uh, outliers in the, in the behavior of the instrument. Another interesting thing that we anticipate wanting to do is to actually have an empirically determined uh, template bank of instrumental glitches that can be used just as we would for, within spiral templates to detect and to veto for things that we know are happening in the instrument. And if time permits, I'll, mention, I'll go into that briefly. And the last thing is, uh, we're in a position then to veto when data are in, clearly in, in, uh, out of the normal behavior due to the ambient man-made environment at our sites. A good point to anchor our discussion then is to ask how well we're doing to date and how we, uh, where we plan on going with, with the interferometers. And you may have seen this in earlier lectures. This is uh, a composite of the three interferometers operating uh, during a three week period, two and a half week period over the holidays when we had a very intense uh, data taking uh, session that we called the engineering run seven. And overall, I show on here where the, the, in, the LIGO one uh, science requirements document goal is. So we see we have a ways to go, but we also um, have a vigorous commissioning and research program that's being undertaken by the laboratory and the collaboration to try to push these uh, experimental curves much closer to the, to the target. One thing that should be mentioned is that this uh, particular run was taken at very low laser power. So at least at high frequencies where we already have uh, the trend that's parallel to the shot noise curve, these curves will 
uh, be expected to drop by the square root of, of the thousand difference between this power and the design 10 watts. So we anticipate an, a quote unquote automatic factor of 30 improvement as we go to full power. And the other thing is that the electronics at high frequencies are designed for the full power configuration. So when operating at reduced laser power, uh, you have a larger contribution of electronic noise that will also diminish as we go to higher power. So the expectation is that the curves at the high frequencies will, do, will, uh, will come down and approach as expected the sensitivity of the, uh, the, the design sensitivity. It's interesting that we have what appears to be a one over F cubed uh, limiting noise in the, in the low frequency, and that's currently uh, clearly instrumental in nature, not, uh, not intrinsically uh, related to the seismic wall that is expected to produce this limit. And that's currently a, an active area of, of investigation by the commissioning team to understand how to, what's the cause of this one over F cubed uh, noise behavior at low frequencies. In several places of the, in several of the subsystems associated with the interferometers, uh, we already know that the electronics need to be upgraded to produce uh, more, a greater sensitivity for those servos that are most sensitive to contributing to the ultimate design performance of the interferometer. That's currently something that's being done by the electronics group at, in the laboratory. Um, some of the structure around 200 hertz is related to uh, known mechanical resonances on the optics tables where the laser light originates uh, that is being driven by seismic excitation at both Hanford and Livingston. So there's got to be some redesign of, of, uh, of out of vacuum components to limit the, uh, their pickup of, of the seismic environment and their amplification of the environment through these structural resonances in, in mechanical systems. And the last important thing is before we go into a full uh, science run next year, we want to upgrade the seismic isolation system at Livingston because we have found that historically we have much greater ground noise motion that depends on the time of day at Livingston than was originally anticipated in, in the design of LIGO, and so that's an upgrade that has to be performed before we can approach for the Livingston interferometer the sensitivity curve of the design. So the battle is noise versus signal, and unless uh, nature is extremely serendipitous, we expect that we're going to have to work very hard to sift through the interferometer data to look for putative events with the initial interferometers. So what does that mean to us? It means that if you look at the signals that might be there, we're looking at integrated signal to noise ratios of 10, which is considered at the margin of detectability. But that means since many of our signals, such as chirps, have extended duration in time, if you look at the time domain data series that are being acquired, the instantaneous dynamic uh, signal to noise in any one slice of, of time taken at 16,384 uh, samples per second uh, is going to be many orders of magnitude below the integrated signal to noise for the entire signal. And this is uh, nothing new. This is very much the domain, for example, that um, astronomers have to deal with when they're looking for pulsars. You have to integrate uh, large epochs of data before you can pull a narrow feature out of the noise floor of the, uh, of the radio antenna. And our focus for the uh, foreseeable future will be in trying to understand and reduce sources of noise. We want to continue to do instrumental improvements, as I've suggested we're doing now, which allow us to control the noise prior to the point where it's acquired and digitized, at which point, once it goes on tape, we're going to be left to the devices of our cleverness with regard to signal processing techniques to do whatever cleanup we can after the instrument has done its best to produce a good sensitive signal. And the analysis uh, strategy that will be exploited for LIGO is then uh, doing hypothesis testing on events that we see to assess whether, uh, what the confidence is that an event may be present versus an event may not be present if we're operating in these really low um, signal-to-noise regimes. I was going to now uh, provide a brief reminder or overview for those of you uh, who've seen it before on how we deal with random noise processes in either the time domain or frequency domain. If, uh, if we have a noise signal that's randomly varying with time, so at every epoch you have a, a, a value for the, for the measured parameter that is uh, statistically uh, random, if you histogram or produce a projection of the number of times a particular value for your voltage, let's say out of your transducer, is measured, 
what you will get is that uh, the histogram manifests itself as a Gaussian process um, in the probability distribution function on how often you measure a value n for a parameter that's distributed about a mean mu with a variance uh, sigma squared. And one can typically uh, remove the variance, uh, the, the mean from the process without uh, loss of generality. So typically one worries about processes for which you have zero mean and unit or uh, normalized standard deviation for sigma squared. Then typically what one wants to ask is if you observe this process over a long period of time, what is its average in the time domain, which then is taken as the limit over the integral over time as, uh, as the limits of the integral approach plus and minus infinity. The other question you might ask is, if I had many different interferometers all operating at the same time, what is the ensemble average of the process, which then is the, not the average over time, but the average over the probability density function that n is observed of the process? And there are certain uh, properties that are assumed implicitly in many of the analyses that are done just to make them tractable. One is that uh, the, vari the, the statistical descriptors of the process uh, are stationary in time. In principle, you can relax this, but typically you assume that mu and sigma do not depend on time in, in many of the analyses that are performed. A very important one is uh, what's called ergodicity, which is that if you do an average over, the, over many different realizations of the noise process, it's equivalent to doing an average of one noise process over a long period of time. In other words, that if you look at one channel and wait long enough, it will sample the phase space that's representative by the probability distribution function the same way that if you had n such samples being observed at the same time for any one instant in time. It's crucial uh, because we have, all we have is one data stream. We don't have a large number of interferometers, at least not yet. So doing any type of averaging involves doing a time average, but many of the statistical inferences that are made assumes that you've done an ensemble average over the population. We go back and forth between the time domain and frequency domain for many of our analyses, and the reason for this is that computationally, uh, many uh, equivalent analyses are performed more efficiently in the frequency domain. And I remind, uh, you then that if you have a process x of t, if you integrate over all time for uh, multiplying by an exponential that then produces a frequency dependent phase shift uh, e to the minus 2 pi i f t, this produces formally the frequency representation of the signal which I term x cap of f. And these are inverse um, transforms of each other so that I can go back and forth between time and frequency by simply changing the sign of the complex uh, weighting function, the exponential. And the processes produce a unit, uh, have an identity function, which is the inverse operating on the function, produces a delta function in time, uh, which is equal to the exponential of the difference in time of e to the minus 2 pi i f. And this is normalized to provide unit area under the delta function. Computationally, you don't deal with continuous time processes, so you have a digitization process that produces discrete quantities. And to a suitable approximation, then each of these integrals can be represented as sums for fixed time steps that then correspond to discrete time Fourier transforms of the process. And these have uh, the exact same uh, corresponding behaviors that I discussed earlier with regard to the frequency uh, domain. The cost computationally that it takes to go from a, t a series of data points that were acquired by an instrument of length n to their frequency representation is something like five times the number of points times the log base two of the number of points for, for the uh, fast Fourier transform, which is the most efficient uh, method by which you can um, produce this representation in the frequency domain from the data. To give you an idea, if I had something like 20 minutes of data, 15 to 20 minutes of data sampled at, at the LIGO sample rate, we have to do something like 2 times 10 to the ninth, 2 billion uh, floating point operations from this formula to obtain this, this frequency series from this time series. If I have a requirement that I don't lose pace with the rate at which data are being acquired because we're going to go into an operational mode where we operate around the clock, 
to maximize the observational uptime of the instrument, then I have to I have to do the two gigaflops, that's a typo, two billion operations in the unit of, oh, I'm sorry. I have to do two billion operations in a thousand seconds, which corresponds to two million floating point operations per second. And in the, in the jargon of computer uh, system architectures, this is known as megaflops, million floating point operations per second. Now, if I had to do this analysis on for example, on 20,000 channels, if I were acquiring 20,000 channels and I was asking for their frequency representation all at the same time, this then is, would be multiplied by 20,000, which starts to take us into um, billions of floating point operations per second, 40 uh, gigaflops, which implies that the architectures that we'll be using to look at LIGO data are going to be clusters of, of CPUs, many machines that are operating concurrently, uh, all doing this uh, part of the same job to accomplish the, the end goal on a reasonable time scale that we can use to, to do the analysis. And if you do the bookkeeping on uh, how much Fourier transformation takes place in LIGO data analysis, going back and forth between frequency and time, we calculate that approximately over 90% of the CPU time involved is involved in doing these types of Fourier transforms. So the question then is, how does this map into what I can go out and buy, and can I afford to buy what I need? And this represents, uh, it, it's an Excel spreadsheet that was calculated by uh, Kent Blackburn in our group, uh, where he took three representative architectures, and unfortunately such plots become dated within a few months because the market-driven uh, performance tendencies are very dynamic. But at least in terms of a snapshot taken approximately six to eight months ago, we looked at a particular uh, 1.2 gigahertz processor with a certain amount of memory, and we looked at the, at the then very new P4 Intel chip of comparable speed. And then we also had a box that had four different CPUs that were in a parallel configuration on the same motherboard, uh, symmetric multiprocessor machine, which is used for doing uh, parallel vector computation. And we basically took a look at how much how many millions of floating point operations per second, that's megaflops here, uh, we could accomplish on these various architectures of uh, CPUs that might be representative of what we want to use for our analysis as a function of how long a data stretch we wanted to uh, analyze. So this is going from the ridiculously small of eight points to uh, a thousand points all the way out to a million points FFTs, and we stepped through the same calculation over many, many data sets just to get a statistical understanding of how many, of what kind of performance we could achieve with such processors. And two things uh, immediately stand out. Not all the computers, even though they have the same clock speed, do equally well, and this has to do with the details of how those particular chip architectures are uh, configured with regard to supporting fast Fourier transforms. So it's important to take uh, representative samples out of the market population of computers that you can afford to buy and do benchmarks such as these before you make a decision on what kind of architecture to buy. And the other thing you see is that you have a plateau and then a very rapid fall off as you get to the longer and longer um, FFTs. It looks like, it looks like they're running out of RAM. Sorry? It looks like in the astrophysics search codes you're running out of RAM. Yeah, unfortunately. Okay? We do very long FFTs and so for us, we're always operating in a regime where much of the market-based uh, commercial CPUs, such as these are uh, representative individuals from those populations, are at a level where we're, we're operating far below the optimum. But luckily, they're very, very inexpensive compared to mainframe supercomputers, so we can still afford to do the job. But the important thing is that you can't just take the clock speed and automatically say how many CPUs I need. You have to do such an analysis as this and include uh, an inefficiency or uh, degradation factor associated with the fact that we're constrained to do very long FFTs for the types of analyses that we're doing. And the interesting thing is that in the mid-range where, where the chips perform optimally, uh, they do approach something which uh, the rule of thumb is that each hertz in your speed corresponds to one floating point operation. You can do one for every clock cycle. And more or less, certainly for the AMD chip, you approach one gigaflop for a 1.2 gigahertz processor for FFTs.
Unfortunately for us, we're down at about 175 megaflops, and so we've got a factor of eight degradation in how many chips we need, how many processors we need to do the kind of computation that we want to do astrophysically. Was there a question that um, I cut off? Well, it looks like if you would add more RAM on the same motherboard, they would just get Yeah, that, that's true. But the problem is it's, it's, it's a level two cache on the chip. It's not the motherboard. It's the fact of whether you can do the FFT on chip or whether you have to use the bus to get the data out of ROM. I think it's a bus speed. It's a bus speed, okay? And that's defined in the architecture. It's, it doesn't change as fast as, as a chip speed does. So it's not clock speed. It's not really clock speed. You know, this is clock speed limited. This is our uh, complete integrated chip on the motherboard limited. And the way you, you extend this out is you either go to maybe 64-bit architectures where you can do two steps per cycle if you're doing 32-bit arithmetic, or if you pay a very exorbitant price, such as much of the high-end uh, Sun, Silicon Graphics, HP supercomputing architectures, they put many megabytes of on-level cache, and that typically extends the performance. But for commercial commodity PCs that we intend to use, given the budgetary constraints we have, we just have, we can accommodate it, and we just have to be aware that there's this inefficiency factor that comes into play. So Albert, this comparison was not done with systems having the same motherboards, for instance? No, it, you, you get whatever the Dell sends you. We bought a Dell, we bought three Dell computers. So that was a kind of a seg, uh, an aside in terms of how computing comes back to touch on what we want to do with regard to signal processing. And one thing that is used, uh, Frequently, and with the assumption that one uh, is familiar with it, are the various uh, formulae and identity that follow from Fourier transform uh, arithmetic. One is, one is uh, Parseval's theorem, which says that if I add the power or energy in a signal by taking its square and add it over the entire time of the signal, I get the same answer if I ask what the, what the square of the power is in the frequency domain. So this is. Uh, equivalent uh, representations of the same quantity, which is total signal power. If I have a signal that's offset in time, going through the arithmetic of, of the Fourier transform, it turns out that I have the exact same transform with a frequency-dependent phase shift that's introduced by the time shift T prime. We collect data with digitized ATC, ADC, so we know that the data are real numbers which means that we can oftentimes take advantage for computational reasons or at least for, or and also for deducing identities when it comes to doing analytic um, calculations that uh, the, the frequency at F and the frequency at minus F of the Fourier transform correspond to uh, complex uh, conjugate pairs. And the last two things then is asking what a signal at a time T multiplied by a different signal at a time t plus tau looks like if I integrate that over all time. And that's called the, uh, the correlation uh, function, r of tau, f between the channels x and y. And if you do a Fourier transform of that, you end up with a, a numerical estimate that can be deduced from, from raw data of what the power spectrum or the cross power spectrum is. Uh, between the channels X and Y. And there's a factor of two in the normalization of the definition because these integrals extend over uh, the full space. And it, for engineering reasons, SX or SXY has historically been assumed to be a one-sided function that goes from zero to F. So you have to, uh, if you integrate from zero to F, you need to get the same power as you get from minus infinity to plus infinity. And there's always a factor of two that shows up when you define the power spectrum in engineering units. If you go through uh, what the correlation coefficient looks like then, using uh, the various identities that I showed earlier in terms of frequency domain uh, representation of signals, what you get is that the correlation between two functions in time corresponds to the product of their complex conjugates of the two frequency representations of the signal, and that's called cross-correlation. And if I make ask what the signal is correlated with itself, I get an autocorrelation function, which is basically the power in the signal that, that we discussed earlier, and that's called the power spectral density of the signal. And the square root of this is what's shown in the LIGO sensitivity curves that I showed earlier. If instead of taking uh, time with the same sign, I, I introduce a minus one, I get what's known as a convolution, where I look historically of the, of the overlap between a function in the past and, and the current value of the function. And just working through the arithmetic,
Uh, not surprisingly, the minus sign here manifests itself that instead of getting a complex conjugate, you simply get the product of the, of the two uh, frequency representations of the signals A and B. And this is typically used, for example, if you have a transfer function where you have a filter that's being processed on the data that, can, that uh, includes the past history of that channel, then the way you take into account the filter function in the frequency domain is a simple product of the transfer function H or B on the data A. An important property that goes back to uh, the, uh, the ergodicity, which meant that it was stationary in time over long periods, is that I can ask what the ensemble average is between a noise component at one frequency and the noise component at a slightly displaced frequency in the signal. And I ask what that average is over time or over the, the population. And if you go through, once again, the arithmetic, uh, subject to a function that has a limiting behavior for sufficiently large epochs of time, such as we will be dealing with, it approaches a delta function. What you conclude is that this function is the power spectral density if f is equal to f prime, but that different frequency bins are orthogonal to each other. And this is useful in many of the derivations that allow you to further simplify the analytic derivations that are used. But that independence in frequency bin, which allows us to estimate statistics, is based on the fact that uh, the noise properties uh, do not exhibit transient behavior. In other words, this is not a function of time. As soon as you have any kind of time dependence in the, in the, in the noise process, then you, you destroy this uh, independence of frequency bins. And uh, the, the typical limiting case, for example, is if you have a white noise spectrum, that could, if you don't know anything about the phase, that could either be a hiss or it could be a clap. A clap is the case in which all the frequency components are exactly in phase so that they add up to a delta function at one period in time. But if you have statistically independent frequency components of the spectrum, that corresponds to white noise hiss, as, as, as we call it. And so this power spectrum by itself doesn't tell you all the information. You need to know about the phase coherence between the bins and whether you have white noise or a very sharp clap. So we have this instrument. We have a bunch of electronics up front that are cleverly designed to produce the best representation in, in digitized signal of what this instrument is measuring in terms of strain. And one thing we do immediately is we capture that on tapes at the full bandwidth. So we have a, a, an archive that we build here at Caltech, which provides a historical uh, ability to look back at any of the previous data that are acquired by the instrument. At the same time, uh, what we will want to do is generate our best estimate of what H of T is from the raw data that are being acquired by the instrument. And the first thing we want to do is consider a series of pre-processing and conditioning steps that will be done in the, in the analyses that we will do on the data. One thing, for example, is if we lose lock, we produce a gap in the data. But for many analyses, you don't want to just stop the analysis to start again. So you have to come up with, uh, there, there, it's not unique, and you just come up with the best way by which you can fill in the gap, so to speak, in, in data dropouts to allow an analysis to continue seamlessly uh, through instrumental periods of dropout. And then later on, you zero out events that may have occurred during that epoch because you know when it dropped out, and so you can use a veto at the end of the analysis. We have to calibrate because what we measure is ADC counts, which comes from a digitization of a voltage. And what we really want to know is strain. And each of those involve uh, rather complicated transfer functions of, of, of this instrument as a transducer. And that calibration takes place at this point in the analysis chain. If we have competing signals from other channels that we know exist, it's conceivable that if we have adequate signal to noise, we can produce a better representation of the fundamental channel H of T by subtracting out coherently, uh, in, either in the frequency domain or the time domain, the contribution and contamination produced by signals that have measurability into the process. And that involves, for example, uh, we invariably will have evidence of the 60 hertz power mains present in many of our data. Those of you who have seen LIGO spectra are well aware that there are all these lines in it. But the lines are very high signal to noise features that in principle, if we had a way to understand what's, what was added to the signal to produce that, one could subtract that coherently to produce a better representation of white noise that goes into the analysis chain. And then one thing is, since we have such a huge data volume, um, 
We want to consider a case in which we want to uh, decimate and reduce the data sets so that uh, for many analyses, we don't need 16 kilohertz per uh, kilo samples per second acquisition. And consequently, it makes the computing job more tractable if you have fewer channels. Just to remind you briefly, this is data from the 40 meter of several years ago. Um, if, if this is what nominal behavior is, then oftentimes, depending on what happens, if you have uh, mode hopping due to angular fluctuations, you get these transient bursts that clearly represent non-stationary noise. Um, you also get this, if the system is oscillating and ringing due to the, vib the normal modes of the system, it is often the case that you get beat patterns that have to be cons uh, taken out or, or accommodated in the data analysis. And then every time the system is brought into lock, the servos produce introduced energy into the system that causes the system to ring, and you get a classic period of time during which you have to basically dismiss the data because it's too noisy, and then you wait and then start looking at the data after that period. Um, this represents an excerpt from a, a paper, GRQC, that uh, Bruce Allen, Hua, and Adrian Ottawa produced back in 99, where they took a look at several channels and ask the question, is there, uh, by looking at the cross spectrum that we talked about earlier, and then looking at the magnitude of the response function between channel A and channel B, where A is the gravity wave channel, um, you come up with a metric by which you can say the degree to which this signal is affected by channel B, where B, in this case, represented any one of 10 channels. By suitably averaging the data that you acquire over a period of time, you can deduce the matrix then that corresponds to how you would subtract out the channel J not equal to A from the signal to produce a better estimate of A, such that this signal is perpendicular or orthogonal in the frequency domain to all other signals. And then if the, the arithmetic is such that this matrix corresponds to the inverse of, this, of the matrix that corresponds to the transfer function of all these channels uh, with a numerator that's the particular value of, of, the inde of uh, that element of the matrix corresponding to the channel KA. And it's basically a, a generalization of a two-dimensional coherence function, which is the power in the product AB normalized by the respective powers in A and B separately, which is a function that goes between minus one and plus one. And in this particular example that was uh, quoted in the paper, you go from a channel for which you just basically have a lot of uh, contaminated signal to one that has an RMS that's approximately something like a factor of two less and allows you to detect a little a glitch which wasn't obvious in the original data. If you ask how much computational power does it take to do such a regression analysis on the fly for our channels, um, the answer is that um, even if you can conceive of understanding to the adequate, to, to the degree you need to do a, a very good job of removing the cross contamination for many channels, such as let's say 64, it is possible to do that on a single CPU machine. It's a relatively in, in, inexpensive calculation. So we have, uh, in our design, we have a, a machine up front that does the signal processing that will be used to produce a, a cleaner estimate of H from the raw data before we feed it into the uh, pipeline analyses that uh, correspond to the astrophysical filters. Do you have any understanding at this point of how much you're actually going to buy with this? Are they going to buy the, anything? The, the E7 data were too transient to allow this kind of analysis, and so it's still in the future for LIGO 1. LIGO 2, I mean, the, um, the 1994 data, one could buy something like a factor of two to three improvement in RMS, in, in but, the, but the corresponding improvement in, let's say, the limiting noise that was quoted in the 1994 paper that came out in 99, uh, that analysis was never done. So the end-to-end -end improvement is still a an issue, and clearly if, if, it's, if it's vanishingly small, you don't want to invest the time in it. But we want to make sure that we have the ability to do it if we decide that we want to. One reason that's of interest is um, most of our data are whitened because you can't accommodate in the digitization uh, domain the, the very large excursions between the seismic limit at one end and the sensitivity in the middle. And 
much of the dynamic range is then eaten up by these lines that occur because even if you have a white spectrum, it's a comb with these many uh, lines on top. And so one wants to consider a situation in which we might be able to compress the data further for archival if we suitably clean it up. So I was going to now uh, digress or continue into discussing the time frequency analysis of data. Up to now, we've talked about individual channels or a few channels. But um, if I consider a very long time series, another thing that I can ask in, in order to assess whether the, syst the, the series consists of stationary noise is to break it up into small chunks and then turn each of these chunks on their sides and create a carpet or tapestry in which the vertical axis is the amplitude of the signal and the horizontal axis corresponds to epoch of time during which that spectrum was collected. This allows us to assess what dynamically changing time series information may be present in the data and it creates an image of the dynamics of the system that are not immediately obvious to the, to, certainly to the human eye if you simply look at a one dimensional time series. And this, the method by which you get there is not unique, but they do derive, um, the time frequency images all derive from a common uh, generalized frequency transform. And what I took here from one of the papers that I'll mention uh, as a reference in the next slide, uh, the original formulation actually uh, occurred by uh, Eugene Wigner back in 1932, where it was used in quantum mechanics where the kernel then had to do with uh, the wave function evaluated at two different points in time and then Fourier transformed. As I said, there's a unified representation of, of, the, of the frequency time transform, T of T and frequency, which is a three-dimensional integral over time and two other frequency components that are integrated out. And you look at the spectrum of the signal at two points, in, at two frequencies, uh, multiplied by an integration kernel. And if the kernel's unity, then you get the Wigner function. And over years, for various different single processing applications, different ker kernels have been applied. The one that we use and have been using currently is a spectrogram, which is basically H is a window function. So this basically, this is the integral that functionally does what I do here, which is I only could collect data over progressively shifted uh, windows of, of data. And that produces uh, a map of the power spectrum as a function of time. I show here before we go into, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. I need a glass of water. Oh, is there a fountain outside? Yeah. <laughs> 